episode 10 of the Photon Podcast, we're going to learn everything there is to learn about repeaters. Stay tuned. AmateurRadio15.com presents Photon, the other ham radio podcast, sponsored by Main Trading Company. Find them online at mtcradio.com. Now, here's your host, Kale Nelson, K4CDN. All right, so welcome into the uh, episode. It is episode number 10. I am Kale, my ham radio call sign, amateur radio call sign. My vanity call is Kilo 4 Charlie Delta November, and I appreciate you being here. All right, this is the Photon Podcast. It is an amateur radio podcast. For those of you who are new, those who are interested in amateur radio, and those who have been around a while and are looking for some sort of entertainment, and I hope that I'm bringing that to you, it must be working. Our downloads continue to increase every time we release a new episode, and the older episodes continue to be downloaded as well. So thank you. For not only listening, but sharing with your friends the opportunity to listen to the Photon Podcast. We're on Twitter. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. We're on Twitter at Photon Podcast. And we're on Facebook as well. I think it's actually Facebook forward slash or backslash, whichever one. Photon. Yeah, just Photon. And you can find links to all this on the website, Radio 15com Okay, I am Kale, and I've got some great show sponsors. Real quickly, Main Trading Company, mtcradio.com. You can find them online there. And if you're around Paris, Texas, you probably know where they are. Speaking of Paris, Texas, and Main Trading Company, they're going to have a big ham radio day, October the 18th, 2014. I encourage you to go, not only for the great show specials, And the great deals they're going to have, they're going to have the MFJ truck and lots of um, lots of reps from different companies, along with giveaways, which equals free merchandise like the Kenwood TS590, which is top of its class. And also the new Kenwood flagship rig. Yes, the eight thousand dollar Kenwood TS990. They're giving both of those away, amongst other things. So if you've been contemplating checking them out uh, in person, that would be a great day to go. It's October the 18th. The details are on the website in the show notes at AmateurRadio15.com. I also have an Amazon affiliate store. When you spend money there, they send me about 4% of the sale, and that kind of helps defer some of the cost of hosting and uh, the other stuff we have to pay here for the Photon Podcast. And I appreciate it when you do. I'm not going to tell you I appreciate it 30 or 40 times like the last episode, but I will tell you uh, it's not cheap, though it's not really expensive, but uh, when you've got five kids and one income, anything helps. So if you're needing something from Amazon, check out the Photon web store. The link's there at AmateurRadio15.com. All right, we want to talk tonight, today, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are, whenever you are, we're going to bring in a new guest to the Photon Podcast, and this will not be, the good Lord willing, the last time we hear from this gentleman, Kilo Juliet 6, Victor United, as we would know him on the air. His name is George Zeropoulos. I'll not try to pronounce it again, but George, we're excited to have you join us tonight, today, this afternoon, whenever, wherever, here on the Photon Podcast. Hi, Kiel. Thanks for having me on. Folks, George contacted me uh, right after we aired the episode with Nick regarding Pignology. And uh, George is uh, he's really involved in the Baynet uh, linked repeater system out in California, which I want to learn some more about. And uh, he was so gracious to put a link on their club, in qu- air quotation marks there, uh, website uh, to help direct folks to the podcast. George has been... Uh, We've been sharing some contact back and forth, really encouraging, and I appreciate it, George. Again, thank you for being on the show, and we're really interested in to knowing what you know about repeaters. Uh, sure, Kale. Well, uh, again, thanks for having me on. And uh, I've been working on repeater systems for a long time. I first was licensed back in the 70s, and uh, way back then, of course, repeaters were uh, gaining uh, tremendous popularity. 
So a lot of commercial gear became available and, and a lot of Japanese imported gear started to come into the country. So repeaters really took off. And so I got interested in ham radio in the 70s, right at the time that was taken off. And and I made a bunch of friends who were uh, uh, really big into building repeater systems. And so I thought that was a really interesting thing to do. So I joined in on the fun and I've been doing it ever since. Fantastic. So you were licensed in the 70s. I was, uh, no offense, but I was born in the 70s. <laughs> and uh, that that's why you're a professional and know what you're talking about. And I'm learning as we go through this thing called the Photon Podcast. Uh, George, there's a lot of folks, uh, and we just recently did a, an episode here about new things for new guys. Uh, I tried to kind of explain what a repeater was and didn't really want to go down that road too far because I didn't want to look like a complete idiot. So will you, uh, with your knowledge, explain to us what a repeater actually is for the layman? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, really, the concept is really simple. Uh, simply put, it is a receiver and a transmitter, uh, plus some other hardware that you put together, and, and uh, it allows you to receive a signal on one frequency and retransmit it on another frequency at the same time. So it, when you get your first radio, of course, the first thing you want to do is see how far you can talk. So if you have a, a handheld radio and you're talking to your friend on his handheld radio, you might get a couple miles. You know, if you have some elevation, you'll get much greater distance, but you, know, you might get a mile or two. Uh, a repeater st- system lets you uh, put a receiver and a transmitter up on a high elevated point, and that could be a mountaintop or a building or a water tower or anything that's above the surrounding terrain. So once you do that, of course, you can expand the coverage significantly, and the repeater itself is really uh, pretty straightforward. You listen on one frequency, retransmit on another. Uh, the tricky part, of course, is uh, to really tune it to make it perform really well. It takes, uh, takes some work and, and you know a little bit of knowledge, and then you can make the system work really well. Now, see, I would have totally blown that up, but thank you. Uh, it, it is so simple, it's almost hard to explain easily. You know, it, it, at its core, it's really simple, and I think what's, what's kind of kept my fascination for repeaters over the years is that it becomes a, um, a resource for your local ham community. And there are so many things you can do to uh, enhance and expand the functionality of that repeater system. And it becomes really a, a, a tremendous asset um, during natural disasters, during uh, community events, just as a focal point for the community. It serves a lot of purposes. You know, back in episode one, we were talking with uh, Cecil after talking about the, the following the Joplin tornado disaster they had in Missouri. And they had they had lost a repeater and they found a hole in their coverage area. But lo and behold, somehow, somewhere in their area that they were operating, there was a tower left over that was 700 feet tall and had a two-meter repeater antenna on it. And it was connected to nothing. And they <sighs> tested it and it began working. So there you go. Uh, you know, it takes all parts. There's, and we could even talk about the parts that are required for a repeater. But uh, wow, we talk about having something that can serve your community and don't even realize it's there. Uh, oh know. yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. And uh, a lot of groups uh, put together those kind of portable systems in the event of a disaster, so that you can field them and and provide coverage and communications where either because something is knocked off the air or because there might be a an a, a area, a geography that's difficult to get to, and you might have to bring in some portable gear. So let's talk about uh, stationary gear right now, and but I, I do want to touch on portable gear as well. But uh, you know, we we we're a new licensee. We've we've got a walkie-talkie, and we're able to get into the repeater and have a conversation with someone. We've never been to the repeater site. What would we expect to see there? Uh, at, at least for you guys in the uh, the bayonet system. What, what would we see if we came into your repeater site? So in our system, uh, we have two radio sites that are connected together. And uh, imagine the in the San Francisco Bay Area, we, we have this big bay and um, mountains that surround it. So in California, uh, one of the reasons I think that uh, repeaters really took off is because we have a lot of mountains. And if you could put a repeater station on a mountain, you get tremendous coverage. So that really makes it in a way kind of easier for us than in other parts of the country. So uh, in our case, we have one site that is in the South Bay, and it's above Silicon Valley, San Jose area. And we have another site that's above the Berkeley, Oakland area in the East Bay. 
Um, so if you go to the, the primary site, which is our South Bay site, uh, what you'd find is, uh, is a, a large equipment rack. It's a, it's a 19-inch standard relay rack kind of a cabinet. Uh, it looks like the sort of thing you'd find in a, like a computer data center. But instead of servers in there, uh, we've got our radio equipment. So, so typically what you'll see uh, rack mounted is going to be the repeater itself, which is the receiver and the transmitter. So that might be one unit screwed into the rack. Uh, you'll have a duplexer, which is what connects the receiver and transmitter antenna ports together. And then the output of that uh, duplexer feed line goes up to your antenna. The duplexer lets the um, uh, transmitter transmit and the receiver receive and not interfere with, uh, with one another. Uh, we have a rack mount power supply. Uh, we also have a rack mounted control system that's the brain of the repeater. And um, that's pretty much it. So if you kind of imagine a single repeater, typically is gonna take up about, maybe about two or three feet in a, in a rack. Wow, and the rest of it's just spare space. Now do you guys, I know that you, uh, you guys out there have earthquakes. We've had maybe three here in the state of South Carolina that I've ever even felt, and they were very small. But you guys deal with that a lot. Here recently, I think you had one or two that were pretty good or one that went for you know a day or so. Uh, are you guys battery power, backup solar? How do you, how do you prepare for something like that? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. So out here, our biggest uh, concern is, is earthquakes. And with an earthquake, of course, you can do a lot of mechanical damage to the site. And we, we have to harden the site as best we can. And we, we do that a couple ways. Um, one is for for power we've got uh, multiple deep cycle batteries and a charge control system so normally all the batteries are being uh, float charged so that uh, what in the event of losing power um, when the AC power goes away the battery bank uh, just keeps on uh, chugging along providing power to the system and we we can run for for a good 24 hours with the current uh, battery system um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is actually adding more battery capacity so we could run for several days. Uh, the other thing that we do to kind of prepare for that uh, is to have redundant systems. So when we designed Baynet, we first put up a, a single repeater. And over the last several years, the system has grown uh, to have uh, several repeaters all connected together. Uh, and we do that in part to provide the ability to have the repeaters connected together or disconnected depending on the events that we're providing support for. Or in the, in the case of a disaster, if, if one of the pieces of equipment should fail, we have something else we can rely on and, and switch over to a different channel. Fantastic. And uh, the hardening part is, is pretty serious. I mean, out here we may think of we have a, a spare tornado or you know, hurricane fragments up here where I'm at in the, in the state. But, you know, we don't really have to consider those things. But uh, we all have to consider the powering aspects of it because we have all of our power lines elevated and, and, and you know, all it takes is a tree and we're done. So diesel generators, battery power, that, that's exciting to, to know that you guys think forward like that. I think a lot of our listeners wonder how they can keep their communications going in a time of crisis uh, or, or wonder if a repeater will be there, and it's my understanding, at least from from what I what I've been exposed to here, just in the state and then nationwide through conversation and communication, is that a lot of or most repeater owners work as hard as they can to make sure that they're going to continue to run as long as they can, even without electricity. Yeah, I think that's really a, a very very common goal, uh, especially for repeater systems that are supporting large clubs that are public service oriented, that are Aries, Racy's, uh, maybe Skywarn or other uh, kinds of, of organizations. So that, that, you know, that hardening or, or the backup power is really key. Um, here in our system, uh, we support uh, multiple uh, uh, organizations. Our, our, our single biggest organization we support is the American Red Cross. So when the, uh, the next earthquake happens, um, they're going to use our system extensively. Uh, in fact, in the last 
oh, in the last five or six years, we've had a few local disasters uh, where the Red Cross was mobilized and relied on our system for a significant part of their uh, logistics uh, and planning and welfare traffic. So, uh, which is great for us. I mean, we're we're thrilled to be able to offer that service because, you know, as hams, we want to give back to our community. And to have someone actually use the the equipment that we can put together, you know, it's it's a great feeling for us, and and it provides a really great service for them. So it's a really win, big win win for both. Tell me a little bit about the Baylink system. Uh, I know you've touched on it just a moment ago, but uh, this started out as a group of individuals who were looking to communicate with each other, and it kind of grew into a repeater base. Yeah, yeah. it's it's kind of funny. It, it sort of turned into a, a, a fairly big community. Uh, and started out really just being a repeater, um, but over the last oh, six, seven years or so, we've we've uh, we've grown into a club, uh, which was never the intent originally. <laughs> so the original goal was to put up a repeater for you know some friends to chat on, and you know if someone else wanted to use it, that's great. Um, so really, two things have have evolved over the the last several years. One is the system has grown significantly in terms of its capability. Uh, but we've also built this incredible community, um, which you can't plan to do. It just sort of happens. And and we've been very um, fortunate to have such a great group of folks in the Bay Area who've uh, kind of called our system home. And and it really makes it for a lot of fun. Go go ahead. I didn't want. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Sure. So so on the on the equipment side, um, the first thing we did was put up a UHF repeater. Uh, the second thing we did was secure a second site. The second site is up in the East Bay, and it covers Oakland, Berkeley, and the San Francisco area. So there's a UHF repeater in the South Bay and a UHF repeater on a different frequency in the East Bay. And then we link those two sites together with a full duplex radio link. So anybody that goes into the South Bay repeater their signal is retransmitted throughout the South Bay, and we transmit that signal on a link channel up to the East Bay repeater, where that signal is retransmitted on the East Bay's UHF output frequency. So, in effect, what you've got is two repeaters have now doubled the coverage area, but it acts like one big system. Now, uh, here in the upstate of South Carolina, two meters VHF is really big. Was there a reason that you guys started with UHF there? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. One reason is that there's a lot more frequencies in the UHF band than on the two-meter band. And in the Bay Area, uh, for for many years, by the time we started, uh, for the most part, the frequencies were all uh, reserved for existing systems. So it was a little bit easier to find a frequency in the UHF band. The, the big plus that you get with that also is the equipment – the, the antenna-related equipment can be a little bit less expensive and smaller. The, the biggest difference is the duplexer. A two-meter duplexer is about three times the size of a UHF duplexer, and it's at least twice the cost. So uh, there's a little bit of an advantage going to UHF as well. And that's why we see when these guys homebrew these GMRS or UHF repeaters, they're able to take the uh, the little notch duplexer from China for 90 bucks or so and, and make it work because the frequency allows it to be so much smaller. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and this is something most people don't really understand at first. Um, so those, those duplexers, the closest you can space the receiver and transmitter frequency on those mobile duplexers is 5 megahertz. And at UHF, that's the standard split, so it works just fine. On 2 meters, the repeater split is... 600 kilohertz, so 0.6 megahertz. It's it's a tenth of the spacing of UHF, and that means that the duplexers have to be much narrower and capable of notching out a frequency much much closer than at UHF. So that's uh, that's a difficult problem, and and you could do that if you have a big duplexer, but it's it's like impossible to do that in a mobile size duplexer. And if you ever see a VHF mobile duplexer, they'll only work in the commercial bands because they're working on about a 5 to 8 megahertz split, which is what you'll find in VHF in the commercial band. Wow. So let's talk about that for just a minute. Uh, a duplexer allows you to, it, it cuts out the other signals, the, the notch notching effect there, like a filter on an HF radio would maybe yeah. be a good good example there. 
Yeah, so the, the duplexer really has two – there's two kinds of filters that you can have, a notch filter and a pass filter. A notch filter is is tuned to eliminate the signal in the other radio. So let's say if I'm I got a repeater and the repeater transmits on 444 megahertz and it listens on 449 megahertz. The filter that's on my receiver, I want to listen on 449. I want to notch out the 444 signal. So that notch is a very steep um, filter that takes out pretty much just that frequency and a little bit next to it. The pass filter is broader, and it it lets a lot of frequency spectrum through around the frequency and then kind of trails off towards the edges. So uh, what you'll tend to find is two kinds of duplexers, a pure notch only duplexer or a notch pass. Mm -hmm. So the the mobile ones we were just talking about a minute ago, those are notch-notch. There's no pass filters. The ones that you'll find at a repeater site, if you're really building a, a performance radio, a performance repeater, you'll have notches and you'll have pass filters. Um, so essentially, the notch keeps your other radio out of your, uh, your radio. The pass filters will keep other junk at the repeater site out of both of your radios. Because at a, at a commercial repeater site, for example, you're going to have not only amateur equipment, you're going to have commercial two-way equipment. And you have to engineer the system so that you not only don't interfere with yourself, but you don't let anybody else interfere with you, and you don't interfere with them. The worst thing that you want is for your site owner to call you one day and say, uh, we just got a call from the radio shop at the police department, and <laughs> they could hear you. That is not a good day. <laughs> so so this is this is a really good a really good place to take this next question. Coordination for repeaters. Uh a lot of guys may not know that you can't just go and say, okay, I'm going to pick up this frequency at uh, 147.315 and I'm going to put a repeater on it. Uh, it has to be coordinated throughout your general area. Yeah, that's right. And there's sort of two aspects of this. There is what does the FC, what does the FCC allow you to do legally with your license? And then what is the convention for how it really works? So legally, once you're a licensed amateur radio operator, you can put up a repeater in the frequency band that you're allowed to that will allow repeaters. So if you're a technician, uh, you can operate on two meters, and you could put up a two-meter repeater, and you could put it anywhere in the band that you want legally. Now, the important thing is you can't really do that practically because you want to coordinate your efforts with everybody else so that there's no chaos. And to prevent chaos in every region of the country, there are coordinating bodies that make sure that uh, all the repeaters work well together. So if you want to put up a new repeater, you work with your local coordinator, you try to identify a frequency that would work, and if there's an interference issue, then the coordinator helps resolve those issues. Fantastic. So the guy who uh, wants to to create a portable type repeater to operate on his deer hunting property uh, they need to be aware as well that they're responsible to coordinate with the uh, the frequency coordinators of your area yeah that's that's true you really need to uh, give some thought to where you want to put your repeater and you know from a practical point of view you want to look at what you're really trying to accomplish so for example if if you are in a in a in a location that's far away from a lot of other hams um, you want to put up a little uh, repeater on your property, it's only running a few watts, odds are no one's going to care, really. So it sort of doesn't matter as long as you don't put it on a frequency where there's an existing repeater close by that would cause interference. It sort of doesn't matter in a way where you put it. Uh, but if you're where I live, in the middle of the San Jose metropolitan area, pretty much every frequency you would normally pick, there's already a repeater on <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's channel. there. Somebody's there, and you know you really don't want to uh, irritate one another. So, um, so there's a whole process you go through to try to make it work. And uh, one thing that I, I that I and I've I've been doing frequency coordination both as a user of the service and and in, in many years ago as as one of the frequency coordinators in Northern California. Um, one thing that's really super important is for a repeater owner 
to work with the other people who are ch ch sharing the same frequency that you are using in the adjacent area. Uh, I, and I'll give you one I little example of that. When we put up our Baynet system, as I mentioned, we put up the UHF repeaters first. Well, a few years later, it, we had the opportunity to put up a two-meter repeater also. And the repeater frequency that became available was previously uh, on a hospital building. And it was a pretty low-level site. So we were going to take that repeater and put it at our site. And now we would have a much bigger footprint. And that'd be wonderful. Um, and so we did that. And uh, we thought it would be OK. And, and so the folks who were using the same frequency over the mountain range in the Central Valley objected to that. <laughs> As, you know, it's, not a, it's perfectly reasonable, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden, their users are starting to hear us. And of course, we had no intention of wanting that to happen. So, so we talked with them. We talked with the frequency coordinator, and we said, "Look, um, we'll try to engineer our system to minimize the interference in your direction." Um, and so, we wound up coming up with an, an antenna system that uh, put a notch in the direction of where these other uh, repeater users were located. And so we're able to cut the signal going in that one direction significantly and still maintain decent coverage in the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, the, the other choice would have been to be difficult, right? Yeah. We could say, well, too bad. <laughs> and, you know, now it's sort of a range war. And, you know, if there's anything that ham radio doesn't need is that. So, uh, you know, cooperation mm -hmm. and, and, you know, really working together is really the key. And, and we did that and everybody got along and it's, it's all fine. Tell me about PL tones, or, or tell us about PL tones. Could that have helped, or did that was that a process you, know, you went through there? So, in areas like um, the Bay Area or any big metropolitan area, everybody's pretty much using PL or or digital PL tones these days. So, so what these are is is a, an extra signal that's put on the transmitted signal. Um, there's about 32 standardized PL tones. They range in frequency from about 67 hertz to about 230 hertz. They're kind of below the, the frequency that you can easily hear uh, n normally. So uh, the idea is when I transmit uh, with this tone on my carrier, that tone will turn the repeater on. Um, if I have two repeaters on the same frequency and they're operating with different tones, I'll key up one repeater, but I won't key up the other. So that helps, of course. But if I can listen to both repeaters, then if people are talking on both, well, it'll be an interference problem. So one thing that people will also do is use PL decode, where your radio will, your, your mobile radio or your HT won't open up and pass audio unless it hears tone coming from the repeater. Now, that helps for sure, and that's been used in the commercial world for many, 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 many years, but it only masks the problem. So, for instance, if I have two repeaters in the same channel running two different PL tones, and I'm decoding re repeater A, and repeater B keys up, I may not hear that repeater, but that transmitter is going to desensitize my receiver. So, it may be blocking the signal getting to my receiver. So PL tones are a way to uh, to eliminate noise and to co-channel uh, more effectively, but it it doesn't really let two repeaters coexist in the same territory unless the um, the usage is so low it doesn't really matter. I got you, I got you. And and folks, those are pretty much subaudible, so it's not a Roger beep that you're going to hear or anything like that. It's just a almost near invisible switch that turns the repeater on for you as you transmit in or broadcast out. Yeah, that's right. It, not only is the frequency low, but uh, we keep the deviation or the, the, the level of the signal very low as well. So a typical voice peak in, a, uh, in, in an FM repeater is maybe 4 kilohertz or so in deviation, 4 or 5 kilohertz. That PL tone is only deviating about half a kilohertz. So not only is it low in frequency, it's low in amplitude so that you really don't hear it. And by the way, uh, if you design your repeater properly, you'll filter out those frequencies entirely from the audio. So they'll never get through the repeater at all. And that's really important, by the way, because in some repeaters, you'll decode one PL tone and encode a different one, and you don't want the two to mix together. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right, so a few years ago, 
a few years ago, you guys, you and some friends decided to put up some repeaters there in the Bay Area. And uh, you built your own repeater and controller, and you began doing that. Uh, I don't. Is it a side business? Is that the best way to say that? Or is it, uh, it doesn't look like a side business when I viewed it on the Internet. Very nice looking website. It's Sierra Radio Systems. Tell us a little bit about what you do there. Sure. Um, it, it really is a it, it's a it's a hobby business. Uh, really, we do it because uh, we really we really enjoy it, and we we did it kind of as a service. So, uh, myself and another ham, uh, John KJ six K, uh, we live in the same area. We're family friends, and uh, we both belong to another radio club. That's a very large link system with um, repeaters all throughout the Southwest, and it's a very complex network. And about nine years ago, ten years ago or so, uh, we decided that uh, wouldn't it be fun, uh, in quotes, wouldn't it be fun <laughs> to design a repeater control system? And since I've been building repeaters for, for many years, um, I know guys who've designed them, and I, I sort of know what you need, at least I thought I did. And, um, you know, in typical ham fashion, we said, well, how hard could that be, you know? to do this. And, and of course you find out, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know when yeah. you start doing something like this. And, uh, it's been quite a journey. So, so we, we started, uh, uh, back in about 2005, we came up with a design, we, we built one and they had all kinds of problems and then we worked at it. And then it took us a couple of years to finally get something that we were, um, pretty proud of. Um, and fortunately, this big uh, linked repeater system, it's called the Cactus Intertie. Cactus is, is uh, 20 different groups that are all connected together throughout the whole Southwest, from California to Texas and Arizona to Mexico and all over the place. And they all use control systems that behave the same way. And there are some really, really smart guys in that group. There are a lot of professional two-way radio people, broadcast engineers, uh, etc., and so we would design this thing, and then we would show it to them, and they'd say, well, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got to do this. And then you'd, then you'd work at it, and then, okay, now it does that. And, and, and then it'd be something else. And then it'd be, so, so it was a wonderful experience because we learned a lot, um, and, and eventually we made a controller that was really good. Um, and, and everybody kind of, at the end of the day, said in this group, they were pretty happy with it, and we're still evolving it today. I mean, it's it's a continual project. So so we we built these things really for our, kind of our own consumption, um, and then figured that uh, since this is a big money drain, that uh, we needed to sell them to <laughs> at least break even on this this crazy adventure. So we we created Sierra Radio as a um, as a way to sell them. So if people want to buy the controllers, they could buy them off the website. And they're really designed for for linked radio networks. They're very high end, rel relative to the pack. There's very simple controllers and very complex ones, and we're really building controllers for networks. I got gotcha. you. Um, so that's our, that's our focus. Cool, cool. Now, tell us a little bit about that. How do you decide to do that? And then, I mean, do you decide that? We're going to just make it where we have crystals, or how we're we going to program it. Is it going to be open source? How, how did how did you come to the final? Well, you said it's still a work in progress, but how did you get to the point where you are now, deciding how you wanted to to put that together? So we we've had uh, experience uh, over the years using a lot of different controllers, and there were people who had made controllers for our linked system uh, previously. And so we had a model of behavior to, to kind of mimic because we wanted to make our system compatible with a previous generation of controllers that were built. And then we looked at the other controllers that were available in the open market and, and looked and thought, well, you know, what are good features and, you know, not so good features? And, you know, what would we really want? And and so we, when you, when you do something like this, you, you start out and say, well, like, what's my goal? You know, am I trying to make the cheapest thing? Am I trying to make the the fanciest thing? Am I trying to make the most reliable thing? What is it? And all these factors are really conflicting at some level. You mm -hmm. know, you, you can't make the cheapest thing and the most reliable thing and the most expandable thing. It just, that doesn't exist. So you kind of have to put a stake in the ground. And so since we were really designing it for ourselves initially, we thought, well, what we really want is reliability and functionality and kind of ease of use. And 
you know, whatever it takes to get that. And, and so that's how we – that was sort of the guiding principle. So I'll, I'll give you one little example. So, so in all the controllers that I've ever seen up to the point where we did ours, um, if you have multiple radios, uh, every radio, you have to be able to set the level. Of the audio, very simple, right? Mm-hmm. I've got I've got a receiver and a transmitter. Those are two levels I have to set. If I have two links, that's two more receivers, two more transmitters. Now I've got six, and so one of the things with it, that we're really picky about is the audio quality. It's got to sound really good, and so he's paid a lot of time and attention to making the audio chain really have good fidelity and make it easy to to set all these levels. So one thing that we uh, did was we said there's not going to be a single mechanical pot or potentiometer in that controller. Meaning, to set the level, instead of sticking a screwdriver in the slot and twisting the the <laughs> level control, all the pots are all digital. They're all little chips mm. that are controlled through software. And the reason for that is a lot of our repeater sites are up at the top of mountains that are five hour drives away. And the last thing you want to do is say, uh, gee, it's Saturday morning. I'm going to drive five hours to stick the screwdriver in the slot and turn it a quarter of an inch and drive five hours home. And see how it sounds then. (laughs) Exactly. That is like, (laughs) that's a bad thing. So, you know, all that kind of stuff can all be remotely done. So it's things like that that we try to figure out, well, you know, what's, what can we take advantage of that's sort of in the market today, technically, to make this just better? So that's what we did. Very good. Very good. We're going to be back in just a moment here with George. He is Kilo Juliet 6, Victor United. This is the Photon Podcast. I'm learning a lot. I am sure you are too. Back in a minute. Visit mtcradio.com today. A great one-stop mom-and-pop shop for everything ham radio. Radios, antennas, power supplies, wire and cable, books and training materials, microphones, headsets, and accessories. Find popular brands like MFJ, Heil Sound, Jetstream, LDG, Alinko, Comet, Texas Bugcatcher, Radio Waves, and more. mtcradio.com, an authorized Kenwood and Icom dealer. mtcradio.com. Okay, we're back on the Photon Podcast with George from California, Kilo Juliet 6, Victor United. And George has been expounding on repeaters, and I am totally digging learning. I love learning. And go back to episode one. Kel's not the smartest guy, brightest bulb in the box, but I'm going to bring you those people in amateur radio, and here we are with one today. George, we've been talking about repeaters. We've been talking about hardware. We've been talking about uh, how they operate and, and even a little bit how to put your own up and get it on the air. Uh, but I want to know what can a repeater do more than just repeat my voice, parrot me, to my buddy across town, or if it's a link system throughout the southwest of the U.S., what else can we do with a repeater? Well, there's a lot of things that have evolved over the last uh, dozen years that are really exciting. If you look at r- repeaters 30 years ago, uh, the t- t- typical FM repeater then is is still in, with us now. So it's a great mode, the basic FM repeater, but there's so many more things you can do. So, uh, for example, one of the big... Uh, a big areas of growth is to leverage the internet. If you're lucky enough to have internet access at your repeater site, then you could connect repeaters together using using the internet. And there's some very popular systems out there. Uh, there's one system called IRLP, which stands for the Internet Radio Linking Project. It was developed by a fellow up in Canada, Dave Cameron, and he did just a he and the team did a fabulous job of building a really great internet connected backbone that allows you to connect your repeater to about sixteen hundred other repeaters uh, around the world. Um, so all you need is an internet connection and a computer at your radio site, and now you can talk to the world. So that's awesome. There's another. Uh, a vo- voice over IP based system called Echolink that a lot of people have heard of. And Echolink uh, does the same thing, but you can also directly connect from your laptop or your mobile phone. Uh, we have users here who you'll hear checking into the repeater. They're talking on their iPhone into the repeater system through Echolink. 
So those those internet based uh, IP services are are pretty cool. Um, another thing that that we do uh, it's kind of a simple thing, but uh, every week on our repeater we run the uh, amateur radio newsline, which is uh, Bill Pasternak's uh, news service. They've been running this for so many years. It's a great service. So uh, we run that every week at nine o'clock on uh, Monday night. Uh, we run the ARL audio news every week also. So, you know, we do that as a service to the users so they can hear the latest news in ham radio. And, um, and it, to do that, we have a computer at the repeater site. It downloads the files automatically, plays them automatically. So we don't have to do anything. It's, it's pretty slick. Very nice. Very nice. Are, are, are there other things that we can do? I, I'm not familiar with D-Star, although I have a pretty good idea of what it is. Uh, but can you take us down that road? Yeah, that's another really exciting area. I think um, it's digital repeaters, digital um, modes on VHF, UHF, they've really taken off in the last uh, five years. So, uh, And there's many now. In fact, it's kind of uh, uh, both exciting and a challenge because uh, today there's at least four different commonly used digital modes um, for repeaters, D-Star, You'll hear another one called DMR or Moto Turbo, which is Motorola's brand name for it. P25, which is used in the uh, public safety sector uh, primarily. And most recently, Yesu's new digital mode, um, they call it C4FM or, or System Fusion. And all of these systems are similar in the sense that your, your, your analog voice audio is encoded and then transmitted digitally to the other end where it's decoded and recovered as audio. So that gives you this kind of works or doesn't digital behavior. So an analog FM, of course, as you go out of range of the repeater or the simplex station you're working, it starts to get noisy. Uh, with a digital signal, typically you hear it perfectly fine until it just drops and goes away. Now, there's there are some other cases where you get garbled audio, but for the most part, you're there or you're not. Um, each one of those modes there's, have, have various features. Um, one of the challenges, though, is they're all incompatible. <laughs> so, you know, it would be like, I don't know if you remember, Kale, long, long, long time ago, if you, when you bought, uh, like, when you bought a cell phone, imagine you buy a cell phone, and, and if you have an ATT cell phone, you can't phone call somebody on, like, the Verizon network. Would oh, that yeah. be this? Would yeah. that be stupid? I remember you know, those days when I worked at Radio Shack. I mean, it, by you know, by today's standard, you look at this and this is like insane. Yeah. But, but that's kind of where we're at. And and personally, I'm a little torn on this because, on one hand, I love the innovation and I love the fact that there's new stuff coming down the pipe. At the same time, from a practical point of view, it's fragmenting the community. So, so. You know, everybody has FM capability. A small percentage have digital capability. That small percentage is now fragmented amongst four different standards. I mean, so why it's not even a standard at this point, right? And that's is that why I hear a lot of people when it's when that subject is broached, you'll hear a lot of people say it's not even worthy of consideration. It's just more trouble than it's worth. You know, I, I think that's misguided. Um, I think it is worth the trouble. And uh, my my exposure to this really started about three or four years ago. Um, a, a good friend of mine came came over and said, "I want to show you something." He comes over, brings a handy talkie and a little netbook, and he connects the netbook to my internet router, and he turns on his radio, and there's a little box that's in between the the computer and the radio. It's a little little piece of plastic with an antenna, <laughs> and and so he's talking from his handheld three feet across the table to this little box. That little box is sending his signal into the computer and into the internet, and he's able to connect to hundreds and hundreds of repeaters around the world. And what struck me about that was I thought, you know, if I'm on a trip somewhere, sitting in a hotel, I could jack into the internet, and I could chat with my ham buddies now back at home. Now, you could argue, well, that's not ham radio because you're, you're using the Internet. But you know what? It's still ham radio because I'm, I'm talking to my ham radio friends using a radio, and 
you know, I'm fine with that. It feels like ham radio. It totally feels like it. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and, it and by the way, at the other end, they're talking on their radios. So and it kind of blew my mind. And I thought, wow, this is actually pretty cool. And, and so that was D-Star. And so um, we, we wound up putting up uh, a D-Star repeater. So Baynet uh, added a D-Star UHF repeater about three years ago. And we, we, of course, we're still running that repeater today, and we have a lot of users. Um, and in this last year, w- when Yesu came out with their system fusion, um, we signed up to be a beta test site for that. And so we have one of their digital repeaters, and that's installed in the Baynet system. And we're running the Yesu C4FM system on that uh, repeater. So, so we're getting <laughs> some good experience in both of those modes. Wow, that's exciting! You, you know, to me, like you say, the innovation is very exciting. But I understand just as you explain how it does splinter, because it's almost like a Ford Chevrolet Dodge kind of an argument, or a Yesu you know, Kenwood ICOM argument. It, it is, and and it's kind of silly because uh, I mean, if it were up to me, I would encourage all of these vendors to pick one thing and and make it compatible. Um, so. Innovation aside, I think the interoperability is really much more important yeah. uh, than anything else. And and it's kind of odd to me, like when Yesu came out with their new system, now that D-Star has been around for 10 years. And and so what did Yesu do? Well, they invented their own system. And you could argue that 10 years later that the Yesu technology is better or the same as uh, the ICOM D-Star equipment. But frankly... Um, the fact that they can't talk together is is kind of the big miss, in my opinion. Right. It's almost like, okay, guys, get rid of the patents. Call it what you want. Just make it all work together. Well, the funny thing is, by the way, if you look at D-Star, um, any manufacturer can make a D-Star compatible radio. There's nothing. ICOM does nothing to prevent you from doing that. Um, so it, it's quite a misnomer that that – D Star is only ICOM from like a legal perspective. So they they uh, basically just open it up, but the other brands appear to be too proud. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, which is silly. And, and the funny thing is, by the way, ICOM didn't open it up because it's the J A R L, the equivalent of the A R R L in Japan that defined D Star to begin with. Ah. ICOM is just the only company that ever built it. So it it's by definition open because it's a J A R L specification so it's the oldest we might as well call it the standard everyone else is just afraid to get in the boat with it yeah and i i just uh, it's sort of a mystery to me i mean i could see if kenwood or uh yesu or someone said well we're not it's not a big community um not big enough for us to bother making that extra feature but once they do go for a digital mode like yesu has they they do their own thing by the way the yesu system is really nice um you know it sounds great um, it's got some nice features. They're adding more features to it. So in a vacuum, it's fine. It's just not compatible. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't have one of their new radios, you can't talk to your buddy across the street. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and so, frankly, I think the next big opportunity is for people to look at building uh, radios that allow you to, to run multiple different systems in that same radio. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens. I hope so. You know, you hear a lot of folks begging for open source radios. Uh, you know, begging for open source HF radios, begging. And there, there's another opportunity. Wow, if someone was smart enough, number one, wealthy enough, or had the backers, number two, uh, they could completely change the face of amateur radio as we know it. Well, and there are people doing that. Um, there are people who are uh, designing the equivalent of the digital technology that's in those systems and open sourcing it. So um, there are people that are doing that today. Uh, now, the challenge with that, of course, is it's one thing to invent the technology. It's another thing to get people to actually build it into their equipment. Right, right. Or even black box it and, you know, you have pirates running around enjoying the tech. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell me a little bit about, uh, since we're talking about repeaters, um, and we've talked about emergency situations in the first segment, uh, do you guys ever do any digital work over your repeaters at all? Digital we, as in digital modes, I guess I should uh, say. Not really. Um, you know, in the conventional FM radios, you really, uh, you really don't do that there normally at all. Uh, you can send digital data through the digital uh, system. So D-Star, um, Yesu, both of those 
systems allow you to transmit uh, digital data along with your digital voice. And there's a lot of groups that do public safety uh, support, public service support that do take advantage of that. Um, we don't happen to do that ourselves, but but there are groups that do. Okay, okay. Um, well, what have I forgotten to ask you? Because I know that there's got to be something that I've missed here, especially oh, for someone who's just coming in, <laughs> who's just trying to... Because we, we've gone down a rabbit hole with this digital thing with... with um, with with D Star and whatnot, but to bring us back to the new guy, to the folks who are who are just dipping their toe into the hobby here, who is who we're really trying to speak to here on the Photon Podcast, uh, where do we where do we go next regarding repeaters? Well, I think what's what's happening is uh, a lot of these interconnecting things are really the next sort of the next wave. Uh, you'll see more and more of that. I mean, it's certainly been happening for years, um, but I think you'll see even more of that. Um, and gradually more and more digital systems. Uh, I, I hope the next wave includes uh, interoperability between analog and digital systems. Um, so from a, from a repeater uh, design, repeater owner equipment side of things, uh, I certainly hope we see more of that. In other words, um, right now, in, like in our system, all of the analog repeaters are connected together. You can go into two meters and come out UHF, et cetera. But when you go to the D-Star repeater or the C4FM repeater, they're really in their own little world. And I would like to see that bridge together, at least um, on command. So in the case of a disaster, it'd be great to be able to bridge all those resources together as necessary. We could do that today in analog. That We do that all the time. But bridging over into the digital side, uh, it just doesn't happen yet. Right. So you could take your analog radio and push data through the digital if you were capable of doing that. Yeah. So if you, for example, if you take a, a a digital mobile radio, eventually that comes out as analog audio. So you can take that and marry it into a multi-ported controller and mix the audio uh, in the analog domain, which is what we do normally for most of the repeaters out there. Uh, so that could be done, um, but that's kind of the exception. Right. Uh, going back to your linked repeater system that started with just one and then two. Uh, and and has grown. Uh, how did you guys, as a group, how did you achieve that? Well, it really uh, was the initial idea to 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 try to expand the coverage area. So we had to find sites that would give us the right coverage, um, and then uh, you know build out the system and kind of make it work. Um, Baynet was really modeled uh, on this larger linked system. So the way that the larger link system was was designed, meaning multiple repeaters in different sites with full duplex links between them and all that, uh, we ba- basically built a, a baby version of that when we built um, Baynet out. So we kind of knew the behavior we wanted, and then it was just a matter of pulling the pieces together and hooking it up and making it work. Fantastic. And how many, you, you say it now it's turned into a club, how many members do you guys run in your club? Uh, we have an email list uh, where people can post questions and comments uh, online, and we currently have 156 uh, registered uh, members online. And is that is that open to folks outside of the area as well? Oh, or? sure, okay. sure. Uh, yeah, anybody who's interested, they can go to the website. Uh, actually, the I would suggest that you take a look. The club website is very rich with content. So it's very, we're very deep. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot there. So if you go to the website, uh, you'll see a lot of the activities that we do. Uh, we do field day. We do uh, something we call the antenna shootout, where we go out to the field and take our HF gear and uh, you know compare antennas. We do um, public service events throughout the year. We do an annual meeting. Anyway, all that stuff's there. Um, and there's a there's a, a a link that explains how to get to the email list, and we can add you in. Uh, it's on Yahoo Groups, uh, so you can find it pretty easily. Fantastic. And we'll have links to all of this. Uh, we'll get George to email me, and we'll put it in the show notes. Uh, man, I, I tell you, George, uh, I think we could go on longer, but uh, I don't know if our heads could hold much more information <laughs> this evening. We're, we're going to have to do – actually, guys, just to say it out loud, George and I have talked about doing a couple of different calls regarding a couple of different subjects and uh, this was number one, big topic number one. And, uh, George, I, I believe that we've covered it really well. Now, 
Uh, just a few episodes ago, I did try to explain a, an FM repeater, which I think I felt miserably compared to yours explanation. But uh, thanks again for enlightening us and uh, sharing with us the excitement that is still in the hobby. A lot of guys look at this hobby as, you know, old guys banging away on a straight key, which there is still a lot of that, but there's still the innovation. There's still the, uh, the desire, the rush to, to get new things out there to be enjoyed by the hobbyist and you guys at Sierra radio systems and at the, uh, at the, the Bay net are, are making that happen. And we appreciate you guys doing that for us here in the hobby. Oh, well we do it cause we, we love it and we just like to share what we do and, uh, we have a great time. So thank you so much, Kale. Appreciate it. From day one, the goal here at the Photon Podcast has been to bring you, the listener, the brightest people in the industry. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe we just finished with one of those. George, thank you again. I can't say thanks enough for being a part of the Photon Podcast. George's call, if you're interested, one more time is Kilo Juliet 6, Victor United. And uh, we'll have all the information about the bayonet and whatnot in the show notes at AmateurRadio15.com. Don't forget MTC Radio if you need some gear. We also have the Photime web store that's affiliated with Amazon. So if you need something from there, check that out as well. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're talking to you. We're connecting with you. And we're going to continue making these great podcasts as long as our great listeners are listening and sharing with us their feedbacks. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you being here. Catch you next time. This is K4CDN73. Thanks for downloading, listening, and subscribing to AmateurRadio15.com presents Bowtime, the other ham radio podcast. You can find our past episodes, web links, and more at AmateurRadio15.com. That's AmateurRadio15.com. Follow us on Twitter at Bowtime Podcast. And remember to visit our show sponsor, Main Trading Company, at mtcradio.com. Till next time, 73s.